Hey y'all, happy Sunday and welcome to this week's live Q&A session. This is the portion of the show where we allow YouTube to send out notifications that we're going live. If you're watching this live Q&A on replay, please scrub ahead until this graphic disappears and the actual show begins. If you're watching live and you have any comments or questions, please go ahead and put them in the live chat. But for now, grab a beverage, sit back, and relax while the countdown timer does its thing. Then we'll get started. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope you got some shop time this weekend. Hope uh, everything is going your way. It's been relatively quiet around here. 
this week. The weather's been so iffy. Uh, we've had a couple of days of sunshine, a couple of days of rain, and a couple of days where it was trying to figure out what it was going to do, and it was just windy as all get out. Managed to get a couple of projects done, but not near as many as I wanted to. Been mainly focused on getting next week's video ready, and oh boy, is that going to be a fun one. Uh, I'll tell you more about that uh, later on towards the end of today's uh, Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, that only works when I have cues. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, we can uh, address them as they come in. But before I do anything else, I wanted to say hello and give a shout out to Steve over at Harneal Media. Harneal Media is the sponsor of my website, marklindsaycnc.com. And if you are thinking about establishing a web store, a web presence of any kind, there is no better way to do it than with a website and a business email with your web domain as the at such and such dot com. And Steve is your man. Um, he is he's absolutely dynamite. Uh, I swear I don't know how the man sleeps because he's everywhere all at once, all at the same time. Um, very proud to call him a friend of mine. And he's very competitively priced and just a very decent all around human being. Uh, the guy, I just can't say enough praise for him. That's Harneal Media. He, there's a link in every video on my channel to harneilmedia.com, sponsor of marklindsaycnc.com. Thank you, Steve, for everything you do. And thank you for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, let's see. We don't have any questions, and I'm kind of out of things to talk about. Let me see if I can invent something here on the fly to discuss. Uh, boy, um, let me throw something at y'all. Um, I don't know if anybody has played around any with uh, bowl bits. Uh, specifically, I have, let me grab one here. I have a couple of white side bowl bits that I used in conjunction with a very small point cutting roundover bit. Uh, I have the white side 1374. This is a half inch shank uh, bowl and tray bit. Half inch shank, it's got a three quarter inch cutting diameter uh, here and a five eighths inch cutting depth with a quarter inch radius here on the edges. Now, I don't know if anybody has ever played with those, but this is a dynamite bit. And I didn't know I was going to talk about them. There are no links in the description. I'll put them in after I'm done. Uh, live here, but that's the white side 1374. It is half inch shank. They do have one with a quarter inch shank. And I'm here to tell you this puppy, I mean, <laughs> it, it flat out gets the job done. But I want to throw a little tip at you. I use this bit uh, alongside of uh, a also white side. This is the 1568 point cutting roundover with a one eighth inch radius round roundover. And this is a tiny little roundover bit. And what I did was I cut a small catch all tray using the bowl bit and then use this roundover bit around the outside and around the inside of the top rim of this little catch-all tray. Uh, 
finish is still wet. That's why I'm not showing it to you. Um, and it really turned out nice. But what I discovered in using these was that when you run this bowl bit, it will, well, first of all, it's a beast. It hogs out every ding dong thing. But when running it in conjunction with this point cutting roundover, and I will do a video on this down the road, what I discovered was I ran the roundover bit first, then I ran the uh, bowl cutting bit, and I discovered that the point on this eighth inch radius bit actually dropped it. it it did the roundover just fine, but after that bowl and tray bit was finished, there was just a slight step, about eh, a little bit more than an eighth. So we're looking at probably, um, I don't know that it was even a sixteenth over. I don't think that it was three sixteenths deep, but there was just a slight step there where the bowl bit needed to actually cut a little bit larger than the vector that I drew up. So I do plan on doing a few more tests using these two bits together to try to, oh, well, my, my lovely assistant, Linda, just ran in down the hallway and grabbed hold of the project that I'm talking about. It's a little end grain. Uh, it, the finish is drying. It's not quite finished. You can see some areas where the end grain is just absorbing that finish. I got to spray a couple more coats. But if you look, especially in this corner uh, here, you can see just a slight step where that roundover bit left a little bit of a groove there. So I'm going to be doing a little bit more experimentation with this. And uh, I can see this groove all the way. Maybe that's a better angle, a little bit better shot. You can see right along the back. You can see that little step there. Uh, I'm going to have to do a little bit more playing around with these two in conjunction with one another to keep from getting that step. I mean, I thought I had it sanded out pretty well, but I guess I didn't. Um, yeah, this was just an experiment to see if I could get rid of some a bunch of end grain scrap. I made a bunch of breadboards and uh, cutting boards for Christmas this year, and this was cut out of the scrap from those cutting boards. So what the heck? <laughs> but just uh, so I guess if nothing else, it's previews of coming attractions. I'm going to be doing a video on the bowl and tray bit and the uh, uh, the point cutting roundover bit using those two together. And uh, OK, I see Sargon is asking, could I show the file? Uh, I don't have it on this computer. I never thought this was actually going to uh, come up. So um, it was, uh, this is spur of the moment. So I don't have this file on this computer, so I can't show it. But um, I guess I could draw it out real fast. Um, yeah, let me, let, me, let me see if I could do this. Um, we're getting some questions in. I don't think I'm going to have time to draw this up. So uh, I'll put this on. Uh, I'll make a note to put this uh, in the unfinished uh, unfinished topics discussion uh, for next week. And I will show you the file. Very, very easy to make. It doesn't take much at all. Um, just basically a few rectangles and then pockets and profile cuts. And that's about all. But uh, so just there's a little bit of finessing that's going to need to happen when you're using a roundover on the top rim of a project and that tray cutting bit, that bowl bit. So, and again, 
the the final finished height of this is about a half inch it's just a little over a half inch tall and the uh bowl bit carved about three eighths of an inch not quite three eighths of an inch so it was just the first time i've used that bowl bit and the first time i've used that round over bit and just decided what the heck um now rob sandstrom is requires a small left offset when setting up that point cutting round over yes either the point cutting round over or the bowl and tray if i would have offset that bowl and tray vector just slight to cut just slightly inward i mean and we're only talking a few thousandths of an inch i might have been able to get away with six or seven thousandths that would have matched up perfectly so that was where i was going with all this was uh there needs to be a little bit of an offset in there so i'm going to experiment a little bit figure out what that offset is and then when i do the video i will show that offset and how to apply it and everything um uh patrick woodco says uh, i had the same issue using a chamfer tool path on the inside like you're describing not sure why it does that it's like the bit list travel far enough along the vector um it's more about the tip of the bit you have to account for the tip diameter of the bit because it says point cutting but um that point is relative it's not a needle point like a real fine v bit it's it let's see if it'll focus in here and if it will, if you can see the tip, that is a flat tip on the end of that bit. That is not a real sharp point. So it's more about that tip diameter uh, than it is the uh, than it is the uh, 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 the bit travel or anything like that. It's the the software is creating the uh, tool path on the center based on the center of this cutting diameter and there's that little bit of a step there because it's a flat point well if that's if that point is let's say a 32nd of an inch wide or uh, a quarter of a millimeter wide you're going to have that little step there and so what i've got to do is figure out what that is and maybe rob is right maybe i will have to apply the uh, offset to this bit instead of the uh, bowl bit but i think if the bowl bit would have cut just a little bit wide i'd have been just fine so um yeah let's see here um uh let's go back up here you had another question um i think rob posted yes there we go rob said i actually did a youtube video on bowl bits and uh and another on round over bits they work great i will go find those videos rob and link them when we're done uh i just wrote a note to myself to do that and i'll link them as soon as we're done live here uh let's see the bowl bit and round over bit yeah okay uh let's see uh let's see steve extreme woodworker was said i was thinking of making a custom profile for my plunge round overs so that i wouldn't need to consider the offset um now you bring about an interesting point there steve plunge round over bits are different from point cutting round over bits and i'm sorry to step away but let me i have two examples of each um in fact i haven't even used these yet oh come on is that the one yes yes okay 
And then where is my other point cutting? Um, L, I don't have a larger point cutting round over handy. Okay, a point cutting round over, wait a minute, is that it? No, that's not it. Ah, carumba. This is typical. Um, down here. Yes, here we go. Okay. Ah. Now, this is a quarter inch radius point cutting roundover bit. And you can see it comes to a uh, more or less a point there. Okay. This is a plunge roundover bit. You see how wide that tip is? Now it's got a cutter cutting edge on the bottom so that it can plunge down into the material. But look how wide that tip is. That's not a point cutting. That's a plunge cutting. And uh, that you can't confuse the two or you'll be in a world of hurt. <laughs> So, oh, Steve, this is what I mean. He's he's everywhere and he's right on the uh, right on it. There are some links to Rob's videos right here. I don't know which is which, but uh, those are the links to Rob's videos on the uh, bowl bits and the roundover bits. Rob says uh, in my roundover video. I cover both types of roundover, plunge and point. There you go. So uh, I guess the lesson to everybody is if you're not subscribed to Rob Sandstrom's uh, YouTube channel, you need to get that way. Uh, he just did a live stream, I think it was Thursday, with uh, Shane Peters where they did a Q and A as uh, on epoxy inlays. And it was a great video, believe me. A lot of information came out in that video. So I would highly encourage you to uh, subscribe to Rob Sandstrom's YouTube channel. And I will put a link down in the description of this video as soon as we're finished. Okay, let's get to some of your um, questions. Let's see here. Dave, the woodworker, wants to know when do you use upcut bit, bits versus downcut bits plus compression bits? Okay. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but we'll I'll give it my best shot. An upcut bit is used when you need the bottom surface to be clean. So if you're doing... Uh, if you're cutting all the way through a piece of material or if you're cutting a pocket and the top surface is less important than the bottom surface of the material you're cutting through or the bottom of that pocket is more important than the top surface of the material, that's when I use an upcut. Also, when drilling straight down, drilling holes straight down like using a quarter inch end mill to drill a quarter inch hole. Uh, that's when I use an upcut bit. Never drill with a downcut bit. Never. You will start a fire eventually. I know because I did it. This is not a friend of a friend of a guy I know knows somebody who once said, this is, I did it personally. I started a fire. When you're using a downcut bit, it's ejecting the chips downward. Those chips have nowhere to go. And the friction of that bit continually pushing them down will set them on fire. I was drilling a series of holes. I was brand new to CNC. I didn't know any better. About the third hole, that bit came up out of the hole and embers, glowing embers, fell off of the bit, you know, flew off of the bit. And I looked over and the whole surface was smoking. Dumped my Pepsi on it, hit the panic button, and pulled the project off of the uh, cable 
and the burn mark on my spoil board was about that big around and the back of the material was glowing and smoking finished dumping my pepsi on that and you know shut everything down for the day and reassessed what i had done do not drill with a down cut bit that's just all there is to it <laughs> a down cut bit is however good for when you need the top surface to be nice and clean because a down cut bit and here's the way you can tell the difference i'm spending a lot of time over here today the way you can tell the difference let me find my up cut uh that's down cut straight v groove down cut down cut down cut where's my up cut there's my up cut okay mm. The way you can tell the difference, they, they do twist differently, but the easy way to tell the difference is to look at the cutting surface of each bit. This is the down cut. And I can tell that because if you look, the shiny cutting surface is on the bottom of the flute. This is the up cut. And I can tell because the shiny cutting surface is at the top of the flute. They're both going to spin in the same direction. But this is going to eject those chips up out of the, uh, out of the cut. And this is going to push those chips down into the cut. With a down cut bit, you will get a better top surface. With an up cut bit, you'll get a better bottom surface. Now, a compression bit has a, I do have one compression bit. Uh, let's find it. Is this it? I don't think this is. There it is. Yes. A compression bit has flutes going in both directions at once that very bottom section is up cut the top section up here is down cut and the section in the center is both that's compression okay this is used when you need a clean top surface and a clean bottom surface the only issue is you need to know the length, oh, come on here. I need three hands. This section down here on the bottom that is up cut, you need to know how long that is because the bit is going to have to plunge in past that level. And this is where you ramp and lead. You'll come way out of your cut and you'll ramp it down in past the level of the uh, upcut portion past that level and then lead into your vector and then start cutting all the way around and when it gets all the way through the material you'll have a clean top surface and a clean bottom surface because it's both upcut and downcut at the same time so ah uh, that's the difference between the bits the um I, my go-to is generally the down cut quarter inch down cut end mill but again uh i'm mainly cutting into the surface and the top surface is what i want to be pretty and the back surface is usually going against the wall so if there's chip out or splintering on that back bottom surface i don't care I'm going to sand that up and it may or may not get painted. It may get finished, but I'm more willing to accept a chip out on the back than I am on the front. So, uh, let's see here what we got. If we have any, um, let's see here. 
Uh, Russ says, uh, I did it too, Mark. Well, uh, you know, nice to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it can have problems. Okay, let's see here. Oh, welcome aboard, Russ Tyndall, Blue Line Wood Flags. Thank you for becoming a channel member. I uh, hope to see you tomorrow evening, 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern, Eastern for the uh, members-only live stream. Check my community tab. You'll find the link there. And thank you for becoming a member. All right. Uh, let's see here now. Uh, let's get into... Tom Miller says, do you have any input on the drawing selection in the create vectors section? It was introduced uh, in version 11 of Vectric. Uh, let's see, in the create vectors section, let's jump over to Aspire and let's see if we can figure out what you're asking here i hope so okay we're in create vectors do you mean the freehand draw tool the freehand drawing tool is that what you're uh, talking about if so i have not used it um i believe you're talking about freehand drawing and if that is the case i have not really used it now, I have heard that folks who use like a Wacom tablet absolutely love it. Okay, is it? Yes. Um, uh, Tom, okay. I've heard that folks who, who use uh, a tablet uh, John Thompson uh, just helped me out here. Works great, and I use the Wacom tablet. Uh, and in fact, uh, John is a channel member, and he is creating a very, very cool epoxy inlay uh, in in the background, hiding in the background uh, in the members only section. And he was talking about. Uh, using his tablet with the freehand drawing tool and he says it's absolutely amazing so much more accurate so much better than a mouse now i don't have a tablet i don't use one so i haven't really used that uh, freehand drawing tool it's one of the things that i do want to get to but as it sits right now i'm kind of focused on learning the pyramid tool because we were that's a more unfinished business. We we were talking about that uh, the pyramid toolpath, and I've got a I'm focusing on that. But uh, from what I gather, they are it, it, using a tablet with that freehand drawing tool is cool. So just throwing that out there. Uh, let's see. Gary N234 says, can two tool paths in VCarve, each with different start and cut depths, but using the same bit be saved to one G code file, or do they need to be saved as two different, as two separate files? As long as they use the same bit, they certainly can be combined into one G code file. If they use the same bit, yes. The only time you'll have an issue is if you're using different bits that can cause issues. If your machine isn't set up for it or the post processor you're using isn't set up for it. So um, you, you, yes. The short story is yes, if they have different start depths and different cut depths and use the same bit, they can be all saved to one G code file. Generally speaking, however, you should order them. Uh, and that's where, let me go back over here real quick. Um, 
I don't have any tool paths created. Let's just do this, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. I'll just calculate. Uh, I can't create a tool path. I need a vector. I knew that. I knew that. Let's do that. Okay, close. Now we'll do a tool path here. Uh, yes, that's fine. Okay, great. And uncheck it. And let's do a pocket using the same one just so I have two tool paths here. And it doesn't matter. Uh, that's where this these two arrows come into play. So if you have a uh, one tool path that is cutting relatively shallow, say it starts at the surface and it cuts a half inch deep, okay? That needs to be the first one that you run, okay? This one's going to cut all the way through the material and it starts a quarter of an inch in. You have a start depth of a quarter of an inch. This one should be cut first. So you select it and bump it up to the top. When you go to save G code and you select the two tool paths, they both use the same end mill, so we're fine there. Visible tool path to one file. They both use the same tool path or end mill. You're fine. Okay. So that's great. But you'll, but okay, I forgot to say something. Um, visible tool path to one file. They are going to be in the order that they are down here. So you have the pocket first, then the profile. The pocket is listed first, then the profile. So put them in the order here that you wish to run them in. And then it will create one G code file, and then that's it. So, all right. And that was a bad example because, as it turns out, those don't use the same bit. But, shh, our secret. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Mark Rolls wants to know, do you have a link to your final thoughts about price, sanding procedure, finishing, etc., when making your pirate epoxy inlay? Um, yes and no, uh, Mark. I, I don't get into the pricing debate. Mainly because everybody's right and everybody's wrong. There are too many variables. It is 100% all about your market. Because you can have all of the formulas and all of the advice in the world and have it all figured out on what to charge for something. But if your market isn't willing to pay for that at that price, you're going to keep it. You know, you can you can price it however you want. If it's selling fast, you're char not charging enough. You need to raise your prices. If it's not selling at all, you need to drop your prices. Your market is going to determine your pricing. Now, if you're selling online, get into other Etsy, Etsy shops and do comparative pricing. Look at what these people, and don't look at what they're charging. Look at what they're selling. You know, you can have all the formulas in the world. You can have machine time figured out. You could have your overhead figured out. You could have your material price and insurance and all that other stuff figured out. All of it's irrelevant if nobody is buying your product. You've got to be competitive in the market that you're looking for. And that's why I think it's so hard to make money on 3D because it's hard to recoup your time and your labor. It, it really is because folks will um, folks will ask for something custom, 
but then they want garage sale prices because they figure, well, you're a small shop. You know, uh, what can you say? I see. I just went in the wrong direction. Mark corrected me. I mean, the total price of the epoxy used. Oops. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't figure out uh, how much the total price was. I, I, I didn't do that. I did, however, get into sanding and finishing, but I cheaped out. I did it the easy way. I knew, um, I knew that this was going to be a wall hanger. That's what it was made for. So I did a urethane finish over the pirate. And as such, I sanded for a urethane finish. I, uh, after I finished uh, surfacing with my uh, Amana surfacing bit, I sanded it with 150, then uh, hit it with 220, and then I gave it three coats of a high gloss urethane. And that was it. And because I knew it was gonna hang on the wall. Now, if it was going to be an actual cutting board to be used for food, I would have sanded up to probably um, 800, then uh, with my random orbit, then switched over to uh, wet sanding with a hand, uh, with a uh, sanding block wet sanding up to about 4,000, 1,000, then 2,000, then 4,000, and then hit it with Odie's oil or similar uh, butcher block or uh, cutting board finish. But that's not that was not the purpose of the project. It was meant to be wall art. So just three coats of polyurethane and it shined like glass. But I uh, put that in the video my last pirate video and i just made a note to uh put that in the uh put a link to that down in the description of this video uh yes steve uh most selling has very little to do with price and more to do with perceived value which is covered by advertising yes you've got to get it out there you've got to get your name and your products out there and this is going to sound like a horrible, horrible segue and uh, name drop, but that's where guys like Steve come in. That's where having a website with a web store comes in and try to get as much traffic to that web store as you can. And um, Steve can help you out with that. Just saying. I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> But no, I did not uh, sit down and figure out how much that cost me. Let's see, <clears throat> Sylvester Smith wants to know: Can I save a file I created as an STL in Aspire? Yes. In VCarve, no, because VCarve is not 3D modeling software. Never was meant to be. Never will be. Uh, in Aspire. I can, and there he is again, Steve. I'm telling you, you demand the myth, the legend. There's a link to my pirate video. I'll also put it in the description of this as soon as we're finished live here. Let me uh, get back over into Aspire here. And okay, Sylvester came back in and says, I have Aspire. Okay. Great, that, that helps. Let me get rid of this and we'll delete that, go over to clip art because it's uh, relatively easy. Let's save an alligator as an STL. After I get my alligator put in the uh, center of my material, I scale him up to how I want it. Now, all I've got to do is make sure it's selected and go up here to model export as stl and there you go uh, click on that it'll bring up a form uh limit the triangles by approximate tolerance i have it here at uh 
four ten thousandths of an inch. And it's asking you how you want how I want to handle the back. I can either leave it open as an empty shell. I can close it with an inverted front. Or I can close it with a flat plane. That's generally what I do. Click triangulate. Then it'll go do its thing. And then you can get into the 3D view and look at it. Make sure you like it. And then save that triangulation. So uh, close. Uh, I was referring to a 2D file I create. No, uh, I don't think you, let's find out. I, I don't think you can, but let's find out. I think you have to have a model because there has to be depth there. Um, but I don't want to just say no, not knowing if that's the case. I think there has to be a depth. So I've got my 2D model. Export is STL. There are no visible components. It has to be a uh, 3D relief of some sort. Okay. Now you can export this. Uh, go to File, Export, and you can export as an EPS, a DXF, an Adobe AI file, an SVG, or even a PDF if you wish. But you can't save a 2D file as an STL file. You can save it as an SVG, but not an STL. So, OK, let's see here. Um, let's get into, um, let's see, Gerd Rutowski. I hope I didn't just butcher your name. Mach 3 normal four axis motors are turning as inspected. Close the program. Reopen into rotor setup. Motors are moving at a very slow speed. Uh, OK, what I'm going to suggest to you, Gerd, is go to the Mach support website. That is the support forum for Mach 3 and Mach 4. I would suggest joining that site, joining that forum, and asking that question over there. I'm, I'm willing to bet that if you uh, re uh, close Mach 3 and then make sure you're opening it in the correct profile and try it again, it may come up correctly. If not, if you've tried that, I would uh, I would strongly suggest going over to the mock support forum and um, joining and asking your questions over there. There are some guys over there like Jer who are absolute wizards with Mach 3 and Mach 4. And if they can't fix it, it just simply isn't broken. I mean, the people who invented and write the software are members over there. So um, it, it may be something like a uh, uh, XML file got corrupted somehow, or you didn't save a configuration. It could be any number of variables. So um, I, I would highly, strongly suggest that you go over there, join, and ask your question over there, because I would simply be guessing. So. And I wouldn't, I, I'd hate like heck to send you the wrong direction. Uh, now, Bob Heltebridal makes a uh, strong point here. You may have to save the setting in Mach 3 before you close it. If you make any changes, if you make any configuration changes at all, you have to go back to the configuration menu and go down to the bottom and click Save Settings. That writes those changes to the XML file. If you don't do that, those changes will affect this current session of Mach 3 only. If you shut down and then start it up again, all of those changes are gone. 
So even turning on that motor and what have you, if you made that configuration change and you didn't save it, you'll probably have to set it up all over again. So it's crucial that you go over to that config menu and go down to the bottom, save settings after any configuration change. Mach 4, you no longer have to do that. It saves each change as you create it. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, let's see. Matt Haas over at Awesome Wood Things says, how do I set V-Carve to use a cleaning path? I want to clear with a quarter inch end mill and finish with an eighth inch end mill. Well, are you doing a pocket? Are you doing a V-Carve? I don't see a V-Bit um, listed. So that's probably a pocket. So let me show you, Mr. Matt. I'll go back over here to Aspire. And go into my drawing tab. Let's say we have a rectangle here. Then you're going to pocket that out. And you want to use a quarter inch and an eighth inch bit. We'll come over here to the pocket tool path. And we'll see, I want to cut, let's say I want to cut a quarter inch into that. So my cut depth is 0.25. Now I've already got my eighth inch end mill listed here, but I want to use a quarter inch for a clearance. So I'll just go select and I'll select my quarter inch end mill. Now I have both of them here. Now I'm going to put them in the order that I want them to run in. Um, and it, to be honest, it doesn't really matter because it's going to create two separate tool paths and I can change those down in the uh, in the toolpath order list. So I've got these two listed. That's all there is to it. Uh, we'll do offset. What the heck? And I won't change anything else. But now you see I've got pocket two clearance and then pocket two. The clearance uses the quarter inch end mill and then just standard pocket two uses the eighth inch end mill. So it's it's that simple. Uh, just list, close. Again, just list both of those tools up here. And I have not found a limit to how many tools you can put up there. Now, why you would want more than, let's say, two, I don't know. Because if you're using, let's say I, I don't want to use a quarter inch end mill, remove it. I want to use my half inch end mill. I don't need to use a quarter inch end mill because the half inch end mill is going to mill out everything it can reach. And then the eighth inch is going to come back and get everything else. So I, I see some people put two, three, four bits in here. I can see that if you have some small vectors out here that say my half inch end mill won't reach, but my quarter inch end mill will reach. Then, okay, yeah, I can see that. You can put uh, as many bits in there as you'd like. I haven't found an upper limit yet, but uh, it's just as simple as just keep adding the end mills. So, okay, let's see here now we got here. That was easy. You, you know, most things are. It's just one of the problems that I'm seeing um, with Vectric, I will give them credit for making it easy. They're putting them in obvious locations, but they are getting to the point to where you almost have so many options it's easy to get confused. Um, and what I mean by that is, think about a difficult software for the beginner, something like uh, Adobe Photoshop. Now, if you're used to using it, you might think it's easy to navigate, but to somebody who's never used it before, there are so many options, you don't know where to begin. Vectric is starting to get 
they're borderlining it on getting to that point in that you have so many options. What do I choose? Um, now, they do keep it simple in that they don't hide it. But, well, let's go back over here and look at Aspire. And just as an example, look at the number of tool paths we have up here. You know, one, two, three, four, six, 13, four, we have 15 different tool paths up here where it used to be a lot fewer than that. Now, uh, you know, bonus points to them for coming up with all these tool paths and including all of these tool paths. But it's starting to get to the point to where, geez, what do I do? Which one do I use? Now, Russell has it absolutely correct here. Vectric is easier than most to figure out how. And that's why that's what I mean when I say they don't hide it. All 15 are right here. You're not going to find any tool paths up here hidden under three sub menus the way you will with some other software. It's all right out in the open. So there is that. I mean, that nothing is hidden. So, but it is starting to get to the point to where you've got so many options. It's like, oh my gosh, wow, which direction do I go? So, and that's that's where just getting into it and playing with it is a major uh, benefit. Uh, Jack in the shop says, I like Fusion, but Vectric is easy. Yes, yes, 100%. I don't use Fusion 360, but it is an excellent program. But for what I do, Fusion is like, putting a thumbtack in the wall with a five pound sledgehammer. It is a way too big of a tool for what I do. If you make parts for assemblies, Fusion 360 is the program for you. It's not as good with the more artistic stuff. It'll do it, but it's not as easy as the Vectric software is. But if you're making parts for assemblies, if you're making gears to make wooden clocks, Fusion is an excellent program for that. If you are making components, let's say you want to build a uh, custom console for your pickup, Fusion is an excellent program for that. Um, Vectric will do it, don't get me wrong. But it's made more for that type of uh, a project. It's more structural than it is artistic. It's just a different market. So, but Vectric does make the controls easy to find. Thank God. So, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Peter Van Vliet wants to know in the molding tool path, where does the term drive rail come from? Oh, where it come from, where it originated, I'm not sure. But I do know that um, the, the, the logic behind it is you're taking a profile and driving it along that vector. You're extruding it along that vector. So uh, the origin of the term, I... I really have no idea. Um, I guess next time I talk to somebody at Vectric, I can ask them. But it's not a Vectric only term. I mean, I've seen that used in various softwares. As you're projecting a profile or extruding a shape down a uh, vector, that vector is considered the drive rail. And why they use that name, I, I'm not sure. So. Um, Patrick says Fusion is using a Ferrari for delivering pizzas. I was thinking more along the lines of a 10-yard dump truck because it's for heavy-duty work when you have a lot of work to do, you know. So, 
yeah fusion is a is is a it's a pretty big hammer so uh let me go back up here and see if i have missed any questions um dave the woodworker says i just cut some foam mats for tool organizers okay from harbor freight anti-fatigue mats upcut bits left fuzzies at the top tried compression bits done a lot better uh for foam uh i have seen where a lot of people are using o flute bits uh made for plastics and they're having good luck with that with those bits rather and o flute the o stands for open what you'll see is unlike on let's say here's my upcut bit here unlike this bit which has two flutes let me see if i can get it to focus uh, come on come on camera you're gonna do this for me come along nope all right this bit has two flutes and each flute throat pulls those chips upward an o flute bit is a helix like a uh, it is a spiral but it's got one large open channel to evacuate chips fast and get them out of there before they can um, before they can heat up and melt that's where a lot of people have problems in foams and acrylic and things like that is those chips down there uh, heating up and remelting along the edge or even welding themselves to the bit so an o flute bit is uh, i have heard from several people that uh o flute bits are are the bits to use on foams so um <clears throat> excuse me there was something else up here i saw about v bits trying to get up here and find them uh okay um matt asked what feed rate should i use for plywood with a quarter quarter inch end mill cutting at 45 thousands per pass i don't know matt i don't know what tool you're using uh i don't know what machine you're using i don't know if it's a router or a spindle there are too many variables to be able to give anybody an answer on feed rates or rpms go to the bit manufacturer's website and look and see if they have a recommendation and then try to match that for your machine okay is per minute and your machine's not capable of doing that then kind of you know do a little math and figure out how you can get close to that uh but there are just too many variables for me to say feed give you a feed rate or an rpm um just way too many uh let's see i thought steve had a okay here he is uh considering getting a 30 degree down cut v bit from cadence manufacturing when they're back in stock this should minimize uplift when i use aura mask i don't know if anyone else makes these i have heard that there is another manufacturer but nobody seems to have an answer as to who that manufacturer may be i don't know of another manufacturer that makes uh down cut v bits uh, but i have seen several uh demonstrations and reviews of cody's uh down cut v bit i'll put it to you this way i've got three coming uh when he gets the 30 degrees back in i've got a 30 a 60 and a 90 on the way so you know i'm gonna try him out i'm i'm gonna give him a shot uh let's see boy you have got a lot of questions today matt 
Uh, I overwrote my tool settings in vCarve for the bits I like to use. Well, that was a mistake. How do I get the defaults back? If you, well, number one, I if you want to return your tool database to the way it was shipped from Vectric so that everything is back to the defaults that Vectric sent you, they have a video in the help section that will tell you how to do that, that will explain how to do that. Um, so just in the software, go to the help menu, then go to video tutorial browser. It's in there. So um, it's, uh, but if you're talking about how you get the defaults for the individual bits back, um, I don't know why you would want to just go in as you use, and I do this every time. I will, if I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill, I will go ahead and set up my profile toolpath, for example. And then I'll go select my quarter inch end mill and I will look at the feed and speed and the depth of cut right there and make any changes and save that. Now, also remember, let me go back over here to Aspire, and we'll use this as an example here. And then this will be the last question we've got. We're, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's say I want to, well, let's go, just go back in here real quick. Select an end mill. I've got my eighth inch end mill selected here. Okay. I will look at it and decide 18,000 RPM is okay for that. 60 inches a minute feed rate. That's pretty slow. So for this, I'm going to jump that up to 80 inches a minute, which means I'll go ahead and raise my plunge rate to 40. Then I'll apply that. That's going to give me a bigger chip load. But even then, that's still pretty small. For an eighth inch bit, that's all right. And then select, and now I'm ready to go. I can go ahead and get rid of, remove that eighth inch end mill. Now, if I'm using a if I'm using a specific bit for a specific material. I'll select that bit, go into edit, and I decide that that's just too fast for this material. I will back it down to, let's say, 60 inches per minute, click OK, but that only changes the setting for this toolpath. It doesn't change the setting for the bit from every, from the rest of for the rest of time. See, I go back in here and it's still set at 80 and 40, close. But if I go to edit, I have my 60 and 40. So edit changes for this tool path only. If you make a change in select and apply it, you're changing that tools criteria. Another thing to look at, Matt, is what material are you talking about? Because this is the settings for that bit in hardwoods. If I go to acrylic, I haven't even set this bit up for acrylic yet. If I go to MDF, I haven't even set this tool up for MDF yet. So your material settings are going to dictate your material settings are, are, are your materials are going to dictate the settings that you have here. Does that make sense? Now, if you really genuinely want to go back to an absolute blank state slate in your tool database, Again, there is a video in 
the uh, tutorial browser, just go up to help, video tutorial browser right here. It'll open up a browser uh, window. And it will show you where to find the default tool database and how to import it to overwrite this database. I would encourage you to I would encourage you to go back and edit those tools before you do that because every tool you have added will be overwritten and it will just be gone. You'll have to go back in and add every tool all over again. And if you've got a lot of tools in your tool database, that could be a nightmare. But there is a way to do it, but you really got to be sure that you want to do that. So, okay, let's see. Uh, I also, as asking Steve, why did the chat change all I wrote to a smile? You wrote the word smile and YouTube does that. It's got nothing to do with us. Uh, YouTube looks at that and says, oh, he's doing an emoji. And boom, there you go. That's something to do with YouTube. So what can I say? <laughs> All right. Um, wow, been on for an hour and 11 minutes. It's been a long one. Um, let's see. Next week, uh, all the people that got mad at me for drilling holes in my freshly surfaced spoil board are going to be absolutely livid because I drilled more holes in my spoil board. See, they got mad when I drilled 10 holes. Um, let's see what they say over the fact that I, I have drilled 36 holes in my spoil board. Um, basically, I went further in depth into setting up work offsets, correction, setting up fixture offsets. I drilled a bunch of holes in the spoil board and set up two separate fixture offset zones and demonstrate how to use that. Mount a piece of material here. Don't even worry about setting X, Y, zero just zip it'll head over to that corner and it knows where that piece of material is same thing over here as soon as this project's done cutting change my uh fixture offset zip over here and start cutting this project that's next week i will get further in depth into how i set up those two zones from the very beginning this is for Mach 4. Mach 3 is similar to get into setting up fixture offsets in your control software. Get a hold of your control software publisher. Find their support forum. If it's uh, GSender or UGS or uh, WinCNC or uh, whatever, and see if there is a way to set up a fixture offset in that software. Not all control softwares will do it. I know Mach 3 will, and I know Mach 4 will. More on that next week. Uh, that'll be next week's video. Channel members, tomorrow, remember, check the um, community tab for the link for tomorrow evening's live stream, members only live stream. If you would like info on how to become a channel member like Russ Tindall at Blue Line Flags did just a minute ago, click that join button down there next to the subscribe button. A panel will pop up and a video will play that'll tell you all about channel membership. So hope to see channel members tomorrow. Hope you guys have the week you deserve. It's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, it's snowy here in the U.S. Stay bundled, but go out and make some chips. Y'all take care. Thank you very much, 
everybody for everything you do. And I will see you next week. Y'all take care.